So without further ado, um, I'm going to start with uh, you know, a, a talk to get us kind of warmed up and primed around site preparation. Uh, both site preparation and veg management are topics that are near and dear to my own heart. I believe strongly in, um, in doing things like this and thinking about these uh, topics because they're, they're important for uh, achieving uh, reforestation of our disturbed sites. So this is kind of what I plan on covering in the next 25 minutes. Let's see if I can get this pointer to work. So a little bit of background or context, um, I'm going to show some examples. These are going to be very, very quick overviews. I'm not going to be able to go into a lot of detail in any one of these, but what I want to demonstrate is that we see a similar pattern in, in this case that site preparation does matter and it, it is impacting how these uh, forests are redeveloping. And then just a summary and I'll be out of your hair for a little while anyway. So why site prep? Why bother? Um, there's, you know, a, a person could argue, why can't we just roll back some soil, smooth her off, and, and call her good? Why should we take on additional site preparation activities? And you're going to hear from other folks later this morning, site preparation is not just about physical soil decompaction. Um, there's, there's other things that you want to consider as well. Um, but I'm, I'm going to talk more specifically about surface site prep. Why should we have a heterogeneous surface? And arguably, I, I think we do it for these reasons. So the first being uh, creating an area that's going to actively decompact over time. You're going to, if you have a rough surface, you allow water to infiltrate and penetrate, freeze, thaw, and you get these cracks and voids that allow for decompaction, not just at the time of reclamation, but for years afterwards. You get a longer benefit of a looser soil. And you also have benefits in terms of water movement. So if you uh, cross rip a hill slope, you're actually going to slow the pace of water movement down that hill slope and that's going to help aid in uh, reducing erosion and then at the same time getting potentially better area for plant growth. And ultimately water, if you have a, a site that doesn't have um, you know, cer any sort of surface compaction on it, you're actually going to get a better water infiltration and this has benefits to plants. And this is all of course interrelated. I would argue that for perennial plant growth, root development is everything. This is the thing we need to think about in the long haul. How these perennial plants are going to develop root systems is going to have a huge impact on how they're going to grow in the future. We can look into the forest industry to see all of the efforts that have been done in terms of uh, road and landing uh, restoration activities and decompaction because they've recognized for a long time that it is important and how the system that these uh, plants are growing in is going to impact how they grow above ground. So if we do a good job of creating a good below ground environment, they'll have uh, capacity to, to do wonderful things in the above ground. Photos I'm showing here are, are two sites that were uh, surface ripped, and this is a, a three-year-old willow. Um, it's one of our summer students uh, measuring it. I think it's about a meter and a half or so. And then this is a white spruce seedling that's three years old on a, a rip site. And then one last thing, uh, other than creating a good environment for rooting, uh, creating surface heterogeneity um, may allow for uh, regeneration of a wider range of species. Not all species require the same starting conditions, but so by having heterogene heterogeneity, we enhance the diversity of stuff that can kind of come up on these sites. Okay, now into some quantitative evidence. Uh, this uh, first project is an older project. It's actually a project I inherited when I, when I started here at Nate a number of years ago. And it was a plot scale study where we looked at uh, comparing uh, different types of uh, surface site preparation to well sites. These were unreclaimed well sites. The soils had never been rolled back. So it was literally just effectively pad material or, or um, sea horizon material at the surface. So already the soils were not the richest. Uh, they, they ever could be, but we, uh, I guess they had decided at the time to go ahead with uh, doing the site preparation trial and, and compared a, a variety of different techniques. And it was measured for four years. So you can see here in the photo, there's these little plots and they're different site preparation techniques and species. Uh, this is a malt, what a VH mulcher looks like. It's a, an attachment to a hoe and it kind of surface mixes the, uh, the ground. Um, <laughs> this one is uh, the mounding. So I think most of you guys are familiar with conventional mounding scoop some material, plunk it on the side, you have um, cavities and then big hills. Uh, Dave is going to talk more about maybe better mounding practices than standard mounding for, for what we're trying to do and then uh, using a, a, a McNabb rip plow as the third site preparation technique. 
four different species were, were planted into these plots. So we have three trees, two conifers, so uh, Picea glauca, Picea mariana, and Populus tremuloides, or white spruce, black spruce, aspen, and Cornus sericea, and that's uh, western dogwood. I'm not going to go through this table in detail. I think you might all cry, and I would too. Um, but what I want to illustrate is a couple of key points in, in terms of results. So we, we measured bulk density at the end of the trial, and we don't actually see really you know, astounding tip off your chair differences, but there are some subtle trends here. And these subtle trends, I, I would argue, are probably important because certainly we see differences in, the, in vegetation responses. So at the lower layers, that's sort of that 12 to 17 uh, depth, you know, where plants are going to be rooting, we, we do see um, a little bit of a, a trend of reduced bulk density. And pH is kind of similar. EC, it, interestingly, was elevated actually with mounding because we had turned over so much soil we had the, the lower soil layers that were, were more saline um, come to surface so we did have, have that effect which may have not been great for plants but there you have it. So in terms of growth and development this is a bit of a busy graph but what I would like you guys to focus on mostly is this last panel here. This is the results after four years. I'm not showing the 2010 results because first year growth is pretty much meaningless. Um, they're just responding to initial conditions and, and the stock. But we have year two, year three, and year four, the growth uh, total height development in these four species. And what you can see is a very consistent pattern. So in, in all cases, uh, using this uh, rip plow has resulted in a significant increase in, in total height after four years. And even in mounding, um, we see uh, you know, a more consistent result in, in the tree or in the deciduous species than in the, the conifers, but you tend to see this trending upward in white spruce. And black spruce didn't show as much as response as the rest of them. And I think some of that actually was the soils more than the treatments per se that uh, black spruce was, was responding to. But the aspen and the dogwood certainly were responding to the mounding, and even the dogwood was, was responding to the, the mixing. And you see the same type of pattern in terms of biomass, so sometimes measuring height in, in trees early on and, and shrubs is a little bit uh, meaningless, so we ran around and uh, cut some trees off and then even dug out some root systems, and I don't know who here has dug up seedlings before, but it's, it's fun. Um, you need lots of students and lots of positive energy. And what you can see here, <laughs> it's true, um, I, I love roots. I, I could be digging seedlings up all day long, but Nate pays me to do other things other than digging, so um, I, I don't get to do as much of it as I like. But what I want to illustrate here, actually, is, is, is a couple of things. Um, one, this shrub, western dogwood, the root development in this species is amazing. And I'm going to come back to this thinking of shrubs and root growth a little bit later, because I think this is not an unimportant result on its own. Um, these things are, if they're growing this much below ground, they're occupying below ground real estate and possibly impacting other vegetation principles. But what you see here is basically the same thing we're seeing with the height growth. So increased height growth with some sort of site prep. Ooh, is that all I wanted to say about that? Ooh, I guess so. All right, so that's that first project. Site prep, better growth. Um, second study. Uh, a little bit of a larger scale trial, and uh, this study is actually ongoing. What we'll present here is uh, three years of, of uh, data collection. Um, but it's a larger trial on a, a fairly old disturbance. It's a reclaimed airstrip. It was reclaimed in um, 2014, is when they did the site prep work, and the entire site was planted in 2015. And we have a six hectare area where we've got these different site preparation techniques that I'll talk about in a minute, but I will just want to mention a quick word about the site preparation that was done to the entire site. It's not that we went out and planted trees into a severely compacted airstrip. We didn't do that. Um, the entire site was uh, ripped in two directions, first with a straight ripper in one direction because it was, it was severely compacted, it was an airstrip, and then it was cross-ripped with a McNabb plow um, to actually decompact that subsoil. And then after this double ripping, the entire site was disked in, in order to smooth it off to put on topsoil. We had very limited topsoil on this site. And as you can imagine, the topsoil collection practices from the late 70s or late 60s was a little different than it is today. Um, so the topsoil we were working with was both limited and not of maybe the best quality. So we had this very limited material to work with and they didn't want to lose very much of it. So they, they dissed the entire site so that they could apply topsoil without having it all um, dive down into the cracks and voids. 
So that was done to the entire area. And then what we did at the, the trial was compare um, two different surface site preparation techniques. What I showed you earlier just with the um, subsoil decompaction and then applying uh, topsoil with a cat, it's reasonably commonly practiced today. It's not a bad practice. It, it works well in, in many uh, scenarios and certainly people are, are able to grow forests in this type of site preparation. But what we wanted to evaluate was whether or not we could see improvements in growth by one more entry, another surface site preparation techniques for the reasons I illustrated earlier. So we have an agricultural disker that was utilized because it was already on site. So it creates some surface heterogeneity, but not a lot. And then uh, this, uh, this McNabb plow. So it's uh, a plow that was designed by a soil scientist, a retired soil scientist here in Alberta. And some of you guys may be familiar with it. If you're not, Google it. There's, we've got YouTube videos that discuss it. And there's a, um, a fellow named Dave McNabb that uh, can talk extensively about the, the science behind that particular plow. You can see here that plow does create some pretty substantial voids. So I'm going to show you two pieces of information um, related to this project. One is density, so established density as it stands right now three years later, and then some uh, growth results. And these results are very preliminary. I don't want you guys to take these as the final word on this project or maybe site preparation in general, but it just it goes to the, the point of why we may be um, well served to do it. And the main thing to take home in terms of the density data right now is that we are seeing this response in the conifers. So when we lump, we had planted two conifers out here. We planted jack pine and white spruce. And the mortality in both of these species was quite high. Um, this was both because the white spruce was summer planted into a very dry summer. And jack pine on fine textured soil from the limited work I've uh, done so far suggests that it's a little hit and miss. The jack pine that survives typically does very well, but you see um, quite a bit of initial mortality. But overall, we're seeing some impact of uh, the different site preparation technique on that conifer density at the operational scale. We don't see a, or a substantial difference in deciduous trees, and these were mostly planted trees. We haven't seen a lot of natural regen of uh, deciduous trees. Balsam poplar and aspen were planted um, at a combined density of about 1,500 stems per hectare. And you, so, of course, there's some mortality here, but overall, it's similar. Shrub density, um, we did plant some shrubs, but most of this is natural recovery, is very similar. So the, the main difference in response so far in density, so presence of trees, is actually in the conifers. In terms of height, uh, again, this is very rough numbers. I've just compiled all of the height measurements that were taken within our density plots and plotted them over time. So in our control disking rip plow in 2016, in year two, no difference in aspen or in balsam poplar. Really, very much the same. Actually, the rip plow on average was a little lower than, um, than the other two treatments. But in 2017, year three, so these trees are really starting to egress now out of their plugs and send out roots everywhere. They're responding to uh, site conditions. The aspen very substantially uh, to the rip plow, less so to the disking. Disking and control are probably the same. Um, and the balsam poplar is actually responding to, to both site preparation techniques. And just a couple of quick visuals on these species. So there's some balsam poplar. This was actually planted as an uh, unrooted cutting. And then aspen was planted as a rooted seedling. This is hormone treated, treated stock. It was a 615A. It's some of the better aspen growth that I've seen for planting aspen. Aspen would be a little hit and miss, but it did really well on this site. So, and this is kind of a, a strip line. So this is rip plow over here, and this is control over here. This is Molly Bannister, one of our summer students. She's asking, why? What's the difference here? Um, but you, you sort of can see in an integrated way, or maybe I imagine it, but the, vegeta you know, the vegetation overall looks different here. In terms of the conifers and growth, you don't see actually much difference in the white spruce at this stage. White spruce is a slower growing species. And again, it was summer planted, so it was also responding to those conditions. But in jack pine, you're starting to see some separation now. So again, last year, jack pine, no difference. This year, we're seeing a big jump in, in this treatment in particular. But we'll have to stay tuned. Okay. Last project. So this, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk more about microsites. Um, so the, the study I'm going to present right now is 
um, two different uh, study sites, but I'll show photos just from one of them. And this was a, uh, a site preparation trial to displace mulch. So um, OSCs, maybe they're not being done today this way, but many um, oil sands exploration sites, at least in the past, and still, you know, this, this site was mulched in 2012, so not that long ago, um, are often mulched on these poor sites, right? As we transition into uh, black spruce dominated areas and, and peatland areas, we have these conifer swamps, which are not peatlands per se, um, but are, are on the poor end of things. And they, these sites do get, they end up getting mulched and then nothing done to them subsequent. And regeneration and recovery is very slow because you have a pile of wood mulch there. And it turns out that inches and inches and inches of wood mulch is not great for regeneration. What you're seeing in the it, that's green here is after two growing seasons is actually uh, horsetails, tons and tons of horsetails. A few trees in this part of the site. There was always there was a gradient on both of these sites. Uh, one end of the site was more mulched or like had heavier mulch than the other end, and you were seeing some recovery on the shallower mulched end. But for the most part, it was pretty sparse. So what we did to trial and see if we could actually display some of this mulch effectively uh, was two techniques. So we have no control in, in this study. It was really to compare to, we knew that some sort of displacement was required. So we looked at two approaches. So one is using my, my favorite plow, um, using a rip plow here. And the other one is rough and loose mounding. So this is not conventional mounding. Uh, Dave, uh, who's sitting up at the front here, is gonna talk to you probably more about uh, rough and loose mounding later. But suffice to say that this is really just about creating heterogeneity than a mound to elevate the microsite, um, so to speak. Now, why, why compare these two techniques? Uh, we compared them for reasons of cost, largely. Ripping is very quick. So on this study, uh, this uh, fellow was able to rip this site at a rate of two to four hours per hectare. The rough and loose mounding here, which was very intensive, is about 10 to 12 hours per hectare. That has direct consequences on cost. So um, a person might have budget to do more ripping than they would uh, mounding. But again, that would depend. That was the main reason to test the two approaches, was, was for reasons of, of looking at the economics. So these techniques were done and then we, we just measured um, growth or well density and vegetation community over the subsequent three years. And this is kind of what the rough and loose mounding look like after three years. So we've got lots of vegetation coming in, in parts that are closer to the forest edge. There's a, lots of moss development, lots of different species coming in, still really rough to walk on, gotta watch your step, good bed for dogs to lay in, still nice overall. <coughs> The rip plow area, um, where the uh, mulch was shallower, we saw really good recovery. Um, the displacement was not as good. So you can see this gradient here in the foreground, you still see a lot of mulch at surface and in the background, you see a lot of trees. That's the fact, that's the mulch depth uh, issue as well. So the ripping helped displace things and stuff was getting going, but at a much lower rate, because you still have a lot of mulch there. You can see that illustrated well here. This is a planted, uh, black spruce seedling and there's some natural region coming around it but there's still quite a bit of mulch there so recovery in, in some areas spatially was a little bit slower. This is a terrible graph, my apologies. I'll, I'll walk you through a couple of key points um, and mainly it's up at the top here with the conifer regeneration, to plant or not to plant. So this black line illustrates the density that we planted conifers at, at uh, site 731 and 435. The blue bars are areas that were not planted. They're left just as natural recovery. And the green are where we planted. And you can see the conifer responses. There's conifers growing in all cases, right? There's natural regen. All of this above the line is all natural regen. More on 731 than on 435. But you get natural regen in, in all cases. So arguably, maybe you don't need to, to plant conifer trees if you get this fairly consistent natural recovery. But what I want to look at a little bit is stocking. So stocking is a measure of evenness. Um, do we see trees in all of the points that we measure, right? When I run circular plots through the entire site, are there conifers in all of those circular plots? Um, and what we see here that at 7 of 31, where we planted in the green, we do in fact see trees or conifers in, in most of these plots, but where we have not planted, we have a lot more heterogeneity. So we have lots of conifers in parts of the site, but not in others. And this is again, a black spruce dominated site. So arguably you, you may wanna have conifers here. At 434, it made no difference at all. So we had a lot better 
um, or more even conifer regeneration on that study site. And again, I, I illustrate the two different sites because sites are different. Um, you know, what we do in one site may not work always as effectively in the other one, and we always have to recognize that heterogeneity site to site, and then infer from there what are best principles and practices. I would suggest probably plant a few trees is a good insurance policy if you want a conifer-dominated forest, but if you're happy with just vegetation and woody species in general, um, all of the deciduous trees are natural recovery. We're seeing at the minimum in these different treatment areas, you know, 4,000 stems per hectare, all the way up to 15,000 stems per hectare. We have a forest canopy developing in all cases, ripping or not, or mounding, or well, rough and loose mounting. We have um, definitely a forest coming in the site, and our tree planting of 3,000 stems per hectare is in some ways inconsequential if you have 15,000 stems of, of uh, poplars and aspen coming through and the shrub densities are even higher. So these are all tall shrubs. This is not things like leadum or cranberries. This is um, willows, alders, um, and this type of group. Okay, so I'm almost at the end. I'm at 23 minutes, so even on time. Um, in summary, so what did I just talk about here? So I, I talked about surface site preparation as a final reclamation step um, in our, our reclamation activities is generally seeing fairly good results. So we, we do see some benefits of doing surface site preparation, but it's not as if things don't grow without it. But there, there's some maybe good and sufficient reasons to think about including it in your reclamation plans. And these effects are incremental. So we don't see the effect of site preparation right away. It comes over time. And I would argue if we measure these sites out for 10 years, the results would be um, maybe tip off your chair kind of results, much more compelling. And then lastly, in wood mulch sites, uh, displacement of this mulch is critical. I mean, I think many of you guys are, are probably already in the converted uh, that way. If we have these sites that have been mulched, we need to do something to displace them. Um, you might be able to get away with either uh, like a, a McNabb plow or a straight ripper to displace the mulch sufficiently, but that's going to depend a lot on, on your mulch depths and your budget and, and these other things in terms of what kind of tools you, you finalize with. And then just to uh, acknowledge, we've got lots of folks involved here. So Penwest is now actually Obsidian Energy. Um, that project had wrapped up last year. And Shell uh, Canada and Canadian Natural Resources, which actually took over um, some of our, our project work here, and, and NSERC are all um, contributing partners to these projects presented today. Whole bunch of folks involved in collecting data. I don't go out there by myself. Um, I, I can't measure it all. So uh, Trevor, uh, Jeremy, Summer students, I think there's some summer students here today um, that are, uh, have worked hard in, in doing these measurements and then um, collaborators involved in these studies. So um, I'm working with a number of folks on, on these projects and I just want to acknowledge their brain in, in these events. So and I think actually Anne is here today. So go say hi to Anne. All right, with that I'll take any questions and that's it.